We're doing okay, all right, very good. So it's the last Sunday of February. Humidity is about 147% outside. So we're so excited that you are here. My name is Jeremy. Welcome again to Oasis. And as Josh said, we're continuing our series. If you want to follow along the notes, uh, it is there at oasisnfl.info, or all the verses will be on our screens as well. But we've been talking about how do we deal with people uh, who are typical people. And the reason why we're talking about this is because... Uh, we believe, again, that Jesus said, if you want to uh, figure out what it means to honor the Lord, if you want to figure out what it means to uh, be fully devoted uh, in loving the Lord, here's how you figure out the whole Bible. Uh, love the Lord your God, he said, with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. So basically the two sides of the same coin, love God and love people. And if you and I uh, talk about loving people, if there people in our lives that are lovable, that command is so easy, isn't it? Like, okay, I love that command. It's so great. Especially this person, they're so easy to love. But what about when it comes to difficult people? That's what we're talking about in this series. How do we love people who are difficult, who frustrate us, uh, who drain the life out of us? And so last week, we said, how do you love people who are critical? How do you love the critics that are in your life? They're either, they either think differently than you, or, or they say things differently than you, or they, they want you to act differently than you actually do, and so they're critical of you. First of all, we said, well, your first response might be not to respond at all to a critic. That might be the most loving thing is just to ignore that. And we said even the idea of forgiving them in the moment. As they're being critical, you're saying, Lord, I forgive them. Lord, help me to forgive them. Lord, help me not to kill them. Help me to love them right now in this moment. But then we also said perhaps sometimes someone will be critical and there might be some truth there. We might want to say, okay, God, point out the truth. God, how can I hear the, the critic? And whether they're being mean or loving or not, God, how can I be constructive? God, how can they? How can I learn from them and hear the truth and put it into our lives? So we want to talk about those things. But if you missed any of our series so far on being critical or controlling people, those are on our YouTube channel. But today, we're going to look at how do we love hypocrites? How do we love the hypocrites? So don't look at them, but if you know a hypocrite, would you raise your hand? You know a hypocrite. Raise your hand. How many of us know some hypocrites? Okay, very good. All right, so we know we are aware of hypocrites, all right? In fact, the number one reason that people either stop going to a church or have given up on a church is because they'll say that place is full of hypocrites, all right? You've heard that excuse as, as before, haven't you? You've heard it before. And I always say when I hear that, I say, you're absolutely right, and there's room for one more. See you. 9.30 or 11 a.m. this week, all right, you're welcome to come because you're a hypocrite too. We all understand what it's like to be hypocrites. And the idea of the word hypocrite, it's not a new word. It's been around uh, for many years. In fact, even before the life of Jesus Christ, this word hypocrite was used in Greek theaters. And what the word hypocrite means is actually stage actor. Someone who wears a mask to pretend to be something else. And so perhaps you've seen those, uh, the theater masks that would maybe have a smiley face or a brownie face. And they're attached to a, uh, a stick and the actor would put that in front of their face to show again to the audience, right now I'm being angry, right now I'm being sad, right now I'm, I'm, I'm happy. And so we see again that the stage actor would pretend to be something else. That is what a hypocrite is. It's kind of like the modern day emoji, all right? We put those up there and we want to portray something that other people see, but we're actually being different. We're pretending to be something that we're not. That is what a hypocrite is. And so throughout the Bible, the prophets uh, in the Old Testament and Jesus and Peter and Paul, to mention some people in the New Testament, they would constantly confront hypocrisy. They would constantly call it out. And so Jesus, over and over again, uh, he love to not only again uh, talk to the religious people but would point out listen here's here's where you think you're right but you're actually being wrong and so several times he points out uh, those who are supposed to be closest to god he points out their hypocrisy in matthew 23 verse 28 we see one example it says this outwardly you guys look like righteous people but inwardly your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness so he says, outwardly you guys look like you have it all together good job however you're fooling us However, you're fooling maybe even yourselves. You're not fooling God. So he says, inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. And so we want to know, okay, what does this look like in our life? Well, it might be, again, the person who's in small group or at church uh, acts like everything's okay. Uh, they, they come and hang out at that small group. They're, they're eating the chips and dip. And at church, they're getting the coffee and they're hanging out. And maybe at small group, they're even willing to pray. But then it comes out 
a little later on that they've been cheating on their spouse the whole time. And you're like, oh my goodness, I, I didn't realize that there was one thing was being portrayed here, but somewhere else there was hypocrisy that was going on. It might be the same thing when it comes to uh, the, the teens and youth group. We call our youth group Switch on Wednesday nights at 6.45, middle school and high schoolers. And it's that teen who comes to Switch and says, yeah, I love the Lord. Yep, I'm ready to pray. Yep, I did my reading plan this week. But then they go back to school. They're cheating on their tests on the weekend. Uh, they're, they're, they're partying the, the, the hardest and say, you know what? Yeah, I, I, I'm all in. But we realize, okay, there's two different lives that they're living. They're not matching up. There's not integrity there. They're being a hypocrite. It's the boss who says, man, church was awesome this week and has a, such great spiritual talk Monday morning, but then treats their employees like they're dirt the rest of the week. It, it, it's the spouse who says, or, or the boss who says, listen, uh, yeah, we're going to agree to this contract, signs it, shakes the hand, but then looks for corners to cut over and over again to save some money and to go back against the deal. It's hypocrisy. And we see again over and over what this looks like in our life. And so the question that it, we have to ask is, how do we respond like, how do we love someone who's a hypocrite? How do we love someone who is actually, and, it, and you're aware of it, like you're aware of the hypocrisy. Like, how do we love? What is a loving thing to do? Do we, do we have a role to play? Are we supposed to do anything? Or do we just kind of stand back and just silently pray, Lord, get him? Like, I, like, like, how do we, pray? like, what do we do in that area? Like, what are we supposed to do in the area of, of hypocrisy? Well, I believe, again, that, that we do have a role to play and, we're still called to love. We're still called to love difficult people. So what does love look like? How do we respond to hypocrisy? Well, the first thing we want to do is we want to, we want to ask a question. And the first question is this. I think it's very important is to consider why are they, why is this person, why is he or she acting like that? Why are they saying one thing and then doing another? Oh, what, what is the story behind the story? God, God again, even, even pray this. God, why are they acting like this? Because once we determine why they're acting hypocritical, we're able to determine what our next step is. We're able to decide, okay, here's how we're going to respond. Here's what we're going to do next. Once we begin to figure out why they're acting hypocritical. And so again, this is a question that begs us to say, okay, I, I want to figure out how to respond. So God, why are they acting this way? Or what might be some possible reasons why they're being hypocritical? And then... God, once you point out maybe a reason why, God, give me the wisdom to respond in a way that will be loving and helpful at the same time. So the first thing is this. Perhaps the first answer as to why they're acting this way, perhaps they don't really know God. Perhaps they're not yet a follower of Jesus. Perhaps they're, they're saying something, but they're not really, uh, they've never been saved. They've never been born again. So in this case, guess what? They're not being a hypocrite. They're being exactly who they are. They're someone who does not know Jesus. So in that case, we don't point out hypocrisy. In this case, we, we point out the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ has done for us. We want to, want to help realize that because here's the truth. In 1 John 2, uh, verse 4, it says this. It claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments. That person is a liar and is not living in the truth. So if someone says, listen, I, I'm a follower, and yet there's no obedience there, we would say, listen, you're, you may not be a follower yet. But the response, I mean, when I go to church. And that's a constant thing. Well, well, our, our church people are all hypocrites. Well, there actually might be a bunch of church people who are just unsaved. And what they need is Jesus. What they need is a salvation experience. And so sometimes, again, we believe, yep, yeah, I'm a follower of Christ. How do you know? Well, I go to church. Well, the Bible says over and over again, that's not the sign of a Christian. That's a sign of a person who goes to church. The sign of a Christian is someone who's willing to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Is willing to put into practice what God's commands are. And so in this case, John is saying, listen, that person is a liar. Who are they lying to? Well, mostly they're lying to themselves. They think that they're a follower, but they're not yet a follower. And so we would say again, in this case, how do we respond? Well, we want to help someone meet Jesus. We want to help someone and cross that, 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 that line of just going to church to actually saying, I don't know about God. I actually know God. I actually know him. I have a relationship with him. We want to help people understand that and follow, uh, follow Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself said as he taught, listen. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is actually a follower of me. The only person who's actually a follower is the one who does the will of him who sent me. So this is, again, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Not just to know about Jesus. Not just to go to church, but actually say, no, no, I know him. I, I believe in him. I'm reading the word. I'm obeying him as, and out of love for what he's done for me. I am a follower of Jesus. To believe again that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that he was married, and that he rose again. To actively not just know it. But to say, that's my only hope. 
Jesus died for me. I've been forgiven, and now I follow him as my Lord and my Savior. That's what it means. And so perhaps they're acting this way because they don't really know God. And if you're here today at Oasis Church, you've been attending Oasis Church, don't know God, I'm so glad you're here. We would encourage you to know God. We would encourage you to put your trust in him and be made new from the inside out. Jesus truly does change everything. So maybe the first answer is they don't really know God. But perhaps the second answer to the question, why is this person acting this way, is maybe they don't know any better yet. Maybe they're new in the faith. Maybe they're still learning. Maybe they're still, maybe they are a follower of Jesus, but they're still trying to figure out what it means. So in this case, they wouldn't necessarily need a lot of correcting, but they would also need some correction with instruction. No, no, here's what it looks like to follow Jesus. No, no, if you're talking this way and doing this, no, that's something that would happen before Christ, but now you've met, and now you've met Jesus, now you've been changed. Now we have different habits and different attitudes and different actions. And so in this case, we're, we're teaching. We're coming alongside to help uh, this young believer. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1, we see this phrase over and over. We're going to see it over and over today. Dear brothers and sisters. All right, so Paul is writing to a church in Corinth, a body of believers. And the Bible says that we put our trust in Christ, that we are part of the family of God. So it says, brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in Christ. What he said, listen, when I was with you personally, I couldn't talk to all of you as if you were spiritually mature. I had to take the time to explain certain things. I, I, I had to take the time to, to not just say something and assume you got it, but to actually teach on certain things because you were all new in the faith. And I love, again, that this picture of infants in Christ. Listen, when we are born again, there's a time of growth, right? There's a time of figuring things out. You're a, you're a newborn in Christ. You're an infant in Christ. You're a teenager in Christ. And eventually, again, as we become further along in the faith, we become able to be able to teach others, to help others, and to grow in their faith as well. So the idea here of saying, okay, perhaps the reason this person is being hypocritical is because they're still new in the faith. Maybe they just don't know any better. And so my job is to come alongside and help and to teach and provide instruction is what it means to follow Christ. It's very similar if you are around, if you have a newborn or, or, or an 18-month-old, whatever, you know, 12 to 18 months, whenever they start walking on their own, do that as well. You have that in your family or in your extended family, and you gather around. And the, the kid gets up, right, and starts to take those first steps, and they fall over. You don't just say, you hypocrite. I thought you could walk. You were fooling me. What are you doing, right? No, you celebrate the first steps. You're like, oh, my goodness, you did so good. And you can stand him back up, and you cheer him on, right? That's the same thing here. If someone's new in their faith, we don't gather around the church. You hypocrite. I thought you knew everything. No, they don't know everything. And so our job is to help come alongside. Why? Because your your family, I love you. I want you to grow. I want to cheer you on when you follow Christ. I want to help you grow in your faith as well. So perhaps the reason they're acting what they're doing is because they don't know any better. So we want to come alongside and help and to teach. And then the third aspect is this. Maybe, why are they being hypocritical? Maybe they do know better, but they're still choosing to disobey God. Maybe in this case, it's not a matter of, uh, of no relationship with God. It's not a matter of ignorance. They know what they're doing is wrong. And in this case, they're still choosing to pretend. I got it all together, but they have this active stuff. So we're going to focus on this today because, again, this is, re this is the re majority of the idea of being a hypocrite. Someone who's pretending. Someone who is playing a role and they're really not actually being true to who they are. And so in 1 Peter 2, verse 16, it says, listen, you are free, yet you are God's slaves. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Peter is writing to a group of believers, to a church, a group of Christ followers. He says, listen, because we're following Christ, we're free. Okay? And yet, we're free from the law. We don't have to earn God's love. We're free from the old way of life. We don't no longer be controlled by, by sin or Satan. We're, we're, we're free. However, we belong to God. We're God's slaves. We're God's servants. We're, God is our father. We're God's children. And so even though we're free, we're not free to do what we want to do. We're free to do what God would have us to do. And so don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. And so what he's reminding us is that, listen, listen, we said this earlier. You're no longer slaves to fear. You are children of God. So use your freedom as not as an excuse to do evil. Or earlier uh, in, in the book of Romans, Paul writes this to the church. And listen, there are some people who say, listen, if I sin and I receive grace, I have a great idea. I'll sin more, 
and I'll get more grace. And Paul's like, no, 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 that's, that's a misunderstanding of what it means to, to have received grace. Well, we, we don't receive grace to get out of jail free card, do whatever we want, and just say, grace, grace, grace. No, he said, no, no, because you've been set free, you belong to Jesus now. You belong to, to God and you're part of his family. So don't use your freedom as an excuse. Don't use your grace as, a, as an excuse to do whatever you want to do. And that's the problem with hypocrisy. Sometimes, again, in our still as sin nature, and as we're following God, we begin to use grace. We can use grace or even our freedom as an excuse to do evil. We can use that as a license to sin. We can rationalize why we're doing certain things. I know, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I can look at these images. Yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus, but it's not like, uh, you know, it's hurting anybody. It's just me. It's only affecting me. Yeah, but I'm still saved, right? But well, this isn't an issue of salvation. It's so simply saying, listen, what is, what is the reason for doing this? Are we using God's grace as an excuse to do sin, or are we justifying it, and are we being a hypocrite in these areas? And so we're challenged. Don't use our freedom in Christ as an excuse to, to sin. And so in this matter of this third, we've answered the question, we've asked the question, we've answered it, like this person does know the Lord, but is choosing not to do what God would have them to do. Now we want to go, okay, what is our response? What should we do? And we want to get this right, because the stakes are really high in this area. Listen, if we choose to do nothing, well, guess what? That person who's a hypocrite, they're not learning. They're not growing. They're not moving forward. They're, they're stuck in that area. They become a slave, once again, to that sin. And, and if we choose to do nothing, people are watching us. People, the outside world is going, why isn't the church dealing with these issues? We see this worldwide in different areas of the church. Why is the church so silent in this area? People are watching us. But not only that, it, it hurts us as followers. If we see we're supposed to say something, we choose to do nothing, that hurts us as well. The flip side also is possible. We could say something and hurt that person if we say it the wrong way. We could say something and the outside world would go, well, why would the church treat them like that? I thought they were supposed to be just grace, 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 no matter what. And we could even hurt ourselves. Maybe we get prideful in this area. So we want to go, okay, what is our response? What do we do? Do we say anything? Uh, what is our business? How confrontational or not confrontational should we be? What should we do? And here's the challenge as we continue today's teaching. It's going to be bathed in prayer. I want to challenge you. If we're going to confront someone with hypocrisy and, and point them back again to what perhaps God would call them to do, we have to bathe this situation in prayer. We have to be praying of this over and over and over again. We have to do this so that we get it right. It's not about us. It's about God. What would you have us to do? So the first prayer we pray is this. Dear God, how many confront this person with the goal of restoration? The goal of restoration. See, this is a serious prayer. Because so often our first result, our first reaction is, God, I have the goal of being right. God, I want to win the argument. God, I'm going to defeat their, 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 their fallacy of their thinking, their, their, their false thinking. I'm going to defeat that, tear it down, and I'm going to win the argument. And that's not the goal of confrontation. You see, again, our goal as followers of Christ is to restore the believer, to, to help the believer, to guide the believer, to go back on the right track. And so in Galatians 6, verses 1a, we see this phrase again. Dear brothers and sisters, we're family. We're, we're to love each other. It says, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Well, what is the goal? The goal is not to be right. The goal is to come back. Come back to the path. Come back to, to a faithful understanding of what God's word teaches and, and obedience to the word of God and obedience to the one who has given us the word, to God himself. Come back to the path. How do we do so? We do so gently and humbly. It's a matter of, uh, listen, I, I hate to say this, but here's what I think that, that God would have me say. Here's what I think maybe perhaps she's off the path. And I want to help you get back on the right path. And so again, the reason we're doing this is not to be right, but to restore. Why? Because we love each other. We're part of the family of God. You see, as Oasis Church, again, that's our mission statement. Well, we exist to guide people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, a guide is different than a judge. Okay, that's not our role is to be a judge. Our role is to say, okay, let's go together as we follow Jesus. Let's together stay in the same path. Uh, if I'm one step ahead of you, that's all I am is one step ahead of you. Come on, I'm going to follow somebody else. If we follow Jesus, I want you to follow me as we follow Jesus together. 
together, let's go after it. We're guiding each other into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Our goal is to restore someone else. Not to be, again, we don't want to be right. We want people to become right with God. Because he is the source of freedom and of truth and of life. It's all about him. Our heart is love. So we see this again in John chapter 8. We see uh, the, the story unfolds. The chapter begins as a lady, the Bible says, is caught in the act of adultery. So we see this lady is brought by the, by the religious leaders to Jesus. We don't see where the, where the dude is. We don't see him there. We just see the lady, right? And, and the religious leaders say, Jesus, our law says we're to kill someone who's caught in the act of adultery, sleeping with someone who's not their spouse. What, what, what do you think we should do, Jesus? They were trying to trap Jesus. They could either trap him into uh, committing murder or trap him into saying the law doesn't make that big of a deal, make, doesn't make that big of a difference. So Jesus' response is so Jesus. It really is. It's so Jesus. He just kneels down and gets to, to write in the dust. And we don't know what he's writing. Perhaps he's writing down man, random sins, or maybe that sins that our people are doing that, that brought this lady to him. Maybe he's writing their names down. And he says this, hey, the first of you, if you how, how about this? The one without sin, why don't you throw the first stone? Why don't you go first? And he goes back to writing in the dust. And slowly, the Bible says, one by one, the oldest of the youngest, they drop their rocks and they, they just leave until it's just Jesus and the lady. The lady is caught, the lady who's guilty. And he looks up and says, woman, where, where are the accusers? And she says, they've all left. So Jesus says this, neither do I condemn you. What is he showing? He's showing grace. Neither do I condemn you. But then he says, go and sin no more. He shows her grace and truth. Don't go back to that lifestyle. Don't go back to that action. Don't go back to that bed with that guy. Don't make change. Go on a different path. Do something different. Go again in a way that would honor God. He shows grace and truth. And that is our prayer also. God, help me to confront for restoration. God, I love this person. God, help me to show grace, but the truth, to get them back in the right path. So God, you have to show me the words. You have to give me the, the understanding to know how to do this. And again, this is not a passive-aggressive thing we're going to do on Facebook. Right? We're not going to find some, some spiritual memes and just tag them in it. Hey, hope you get it. Right? Hope you get it. No. Coffee, one-on-one -on -one time. Hey, here's what I think. I just want to point this out. You know, and here's, I don't know if you're on the right path here. I just want to help you in this area. Again, difficult conversation? Yes. Loving conversation? Yes. This is what we're called to do. So God, help me to confront for restoration. And that second prayer, God, help me to confront carefully. God, help me to confront carefully. I don't want to just, off the top of my head, do this. I don't want to just be mindful of this, but also I want to make sure that my heart is right. You see, we go back to Galatians 6. It says, Dear brothers, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back into the right path. Then it concludes, and be careful not to fall to the same temptation yourself. So God, I, I want to confront carefully, but God, I want to do it out of pride. And God, I don't want to think that I'm better than anyone. But help me to see my place in your kingdom. God, help me to know my role in this situation. And God, above all, I don't want to fall into the same trap. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says, If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. Pride goes before a fall. So if we're seeing something in someone else's life, it's so easy for us to go, you know what? Well, I don't struggle with that. Well, clearly I'm better than you in this area because I don't have any issues in that area. And it's really easy for us to, whoa, get prideful. So we want to go, no, 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 God, help me not to become prideful. God, help my heart uh, to be safe. I don't want to fall into the same trap. And so our goal is to, to confront for restoration, but also to confront carefully. Because sometimes, again, we might have the similar issue as we're confronting in somebody else. So how do we restore? What does it look like to confront carefully? Well, we see wisdom from the Word of God. In Matthew 18, we see a formula for how to restore someone carefully. So we just unpack this for a few minutes. It says, starting in verse 15 of Matthew 18, it says, If another believer sins against you, so again, another believer, another follower of Jesus, family member, right? If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. So a couple of things here. All right? This is another believer. 
If someone who does not know the Lord offends you, this is a different situation. We are never called as the church to judge outsiders. Okay, people who, who, who act like sinners because they're sinners are supposed to act like sinners because they're sinners. Okay, they're outside of God, the kingdom of God. They're outside of what God would do. How in the world, because they walk in darkness, how in the world would we expect them to walk in light? We don't judge them to the same standards. And so our job, again, is to love sinners so that they might be saved. That is our job. So if they're outside the faith, man, we're not going to judge who you are. Man, we want you to come to Jesus. We want you to find life in Jesus. You're going a different direction. We don't judge you the same standard as the church. Man, you have a different standard. Uh, but, but the same way, we want you to meet Jesus. There's good news. There's hope and life and grace and truth for you. So listen, as a waste church, people who don't know the Lord come in, guess what? They are welcome before they believe. We welcome them before they believe. Why? So that they might believe. So that they might be changed from the inside out. So we have a love for outsiders, right? So this is saying again, if another believer sins against you, okay, this is different. But they vocally said, that I'm following Jesus. They're seeking to be part of the church. We're following Jesus. And if that sin happens, then we want to go, okay, how do we work this out? So if this says, again, go privately. So we're not doing the, the rant on Facebook. Isn't that the worst rant where there's something going on that they don't really say what's going on? That's the worst rant, right? Because you're like, they have to comment, like, I wonder what's going on. Like, I don't care, right? Just tell me exactly what it is or just don't say anything, right? That's kind of the same thing. But here's the same thing. We're saying go privately. I'm not going to call you out publicly. I'm not going to yell in the, and when I see you at the ball. There you are, hypocrite. Good to see you. <laughs> Hypocrites shop at Walmart too, I guess, all right? No, we don't do that, right? We're saying go privately. Hey, this is what... I just want you to know something. When this happened, here's how it came across, or here's how I took it, or I just want you to know, hey, I saw you at church, but then I also saw you here. Hey, what's going on? What's And begin to just talk privately. Uh, begin to confront them carefully with the idea of restoration. Maybe, again, we misunderstood the situation. Okay, so maybe we need to be corrected in that area. But there are other times, like it says here, the other person can listen and confess. Okay, so it was true that there was something that needed to be confessed and talked about. If that person does that, you won that person back. Guess what? We, we're in life group. Guess what? We're in church. Guess what? We want to have fellowship. Fellowship's been broken, but now it's back. It's restored. Awesome. First up, restoration. Is this difficult? It's one verse. Yes, it's difficult. A lot is unpacked in this one verse. But then it says in verse 16, it says, if that person, if you are unsuccessful with that person, Take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. So again, you have this idea of, listen, I, that, did, that coffee didn't go well. I thought it might you know, go well in restoration, but restoration hasn't happened yet. So we need to follow up with some two or three other members of, of our small group. We love each other. We know each other. And we, we want to pray for you. Hey, what's going on here? How can we help? How can you begin to see that perhaps you're on the wrong path here? Hey, listen. Oh, you have this situation here? And again, churches, right? A pastor who's acting in a way that's inappropriate, that says one thing and is living another, okay? Because we've seen over and over again, pastors are humans. We all have issues, all right? So two or three others. Now again, hey, listen, I tried talking to you about this, but you didn't receive it very well. So I just want to let you know, I just want to run the record here just to kind of understand what we're talking about. And again, the goal of this is not to win the argument. It's not to gang up on the person. It's to restore. Hey, listen, we love you. We want this back on. Hey, listen, you're the pastor of our church, but you're you're blinded here. What, we need to help you see what's going on and, and to kind of talk through those things. Again, we have this formula of restoration. It could go well here. It might not. In fact, verse 17 says, however, if that person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. So we start privately, then a couple Two or three witnesses, and then like the whole life group. Hey guys, just so you know, and we've been praying for this, and there's a situation, and it's 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 not fun, and it's messy, but we love this person, and we want to get this right, we want to deal with this. Or maybe the whole church, hey listen, the pastor has done these things, and the church needs to know about it, and he's refusing, he or she is refusing to, uh, to deal with this stuff, and so we're going to have, basically redefine the relationship. Basically what we're saying is, we're not going to agree that this person still is in right standing with God and us, and they keep doing what they're doing. Okay? So what, we, what does that mean? Well, that means, again, we're not going to pretend that everything's okay. When we see them, we love them. 
When we hang out with them, have coffee with them, we, we love them. Put the goal that they'll, that they'll repent. Put the goal that they'll come back. But for right now, they can't pretend everything's okay and that we're okay with what they're doing after confrontation, after what God is pointing out, and they're going to just keep going their own direction. They're on the wrong path. And so our job as a church, the most loving thing we can do is to confront grace and truth. Why? For restoration. Why? So that, again, the name of Christ is, is increased in our area, not made fun of or not made light of. Is this difficult? Yes, absolutely. But yet, it's also the most loving thing we can do. And so if someone want to wrestle with them, we have to pray. That's why I said earlier, we have to bathe this in prayer. God, we have to get this right. God, it can't be about us. It can't be prideful. It can't be about us winning the argument. God, we want your name to be lifted up. We want restoration to happen. We want people to, to be see the light and be brought to truth. And we want people to be, to be able to grow from this and to grow where you're calling us to grow. We want to prayerfully confront God. Help us to confront restoration. Dear God, help us to confront carefully. The third prayer we pray is this. God, help me to see when, when I'm the hypocrite. And help me to see when I'm the hypocrite. So earlier today, I asked us if you know a hypocrite. Most hands went up in here. Well, guess what that means? If most hands went up, that means people know you as well. So perhaps you're being the hypocrite. And not perhaps you are being the hypocrite sometimes. And I'm being the hypocrite sometimes. If we all deal with this. And what's interesting, again, in, in, in our literature, and our movies, when it comes to vampires, vampires, you can't see a vampire in the mirror. <laughs> right? Did you know that? Did you realize that? Well, sometimes the same thing is true for hypocrisy. It's really easy to see in other people. But when we look in the mirror, we're like, I'm fine. We're great. And we need someone outside of us go say, you know what? You have an issue here. The reason it's called a blind spot is because it's actually called a blind spot. Like, we can't see it. But someone else can. And so our prayer should be, God, when someone sits in me down to privately confront me, that help me be open to see that I'm the hypocrite. And God, before I point out someone else's issues, God, point out of me any way that offends you. Help me to see my own hypocrisy. Because sometimes, again, wherever we are most condemning, something to consider. Wherever we are most condemning in others is often a reflection, a reflection of where we are most vulnerable. The reason we might see the sin in other people so often because that's also the same sin that trips us up. So we know what we're looking for because we struggle with it as well. So we want to be people who are willing to say, listen, I don't have it all together either. I have issues as well. And God, I pray that you would help me be open to hearing from you, to not make excuses, to not justify my actions, but to still want to have a heart for, to make sure I'm on the right path as well, to be open to what other people might say it to me because they're going to show love to me if they're trying to help me restore to what you would have me to be. We see an example of this in the, in the Bible, King David. King David is a man who's been anointed by God to be king of Israel. But the Bible says in, in one case that, that David had a man after God's own heart. So David has a lot going for him. We see as a young boy that he kills Goliath. He's anointed to be king of Israel. God is using him in a mighty, mighty way. God, he writes many of the Psalms that we read today, the book of Psalms. Those are songs of praise to God, songs of prayer to God. And yet we see that David is not perfect. David is a sinner like you and I. And one day, David begins to be a hypocrite. It, it, in fact, it says that in springtime, when the kings would go to war, David stays back in the capital city of Jerusalem. So David plays the hypocrite. He's pretending to be the king, to be the leader, but he's saying, all right, you guys go do the war. I'll stay back here. He's pretending to be something he's not. And while he's there in Jerusalem, we see one night he's on his roof, and he sees this lady bathing. Okay, so I don't know the situation that's going on there, but he sees this lady bathing, right? So he says, you know what? I want to be with that lady. I'm not married to her, but I want to be with her. And so he calls Bathsheba to his house. They spend the night together, and Bathsheba becomes pregnant. So David, being a hypocrite, continues to pretend that everything is okay. He says, listen, I, I got to get Bathsheba's husband, who, by the way, is in my army fighting where I should be. He's being faithful. I'm going to have Uriah come back. Maybe he'll sleep with his wife. He'll think the baby's his. I'll be good to go. I'll be off the hook. Uriah comes back, and basically he, asks, he, he and treats the situation with more honor than David ever could possibly imagine the situation. Uriah says, how am I supposed to enjoy a night at, at, at my house when my fellow soldiers are in the, in the battlefield? So to honor them, 
I'm not going to go home to my wife. I'm going to sleep at the door. And David's like, come on, seriously. And, it, and right, Uriah's refusing to do this. And so David says, i got to have another plan. So he sends Uriah back with a note. Hey, give this to the leader. Give this to your captain, to your general. And so that note that Uriah doesn't read is delivered by Uriah. And that note basically says this. He put Uriah where the fiercest fighting is. And then while it's going on, kind of pulls, pull back a little bit. Don't tell Uriah. Pull back some of the soldiers and let him die. Interesting instruction. But the general and captain are the, the leader follows the instruction. And word gets back to David. David, Uriah died. And David placed the hypocrite. <gasps> Uriah, I can't believe you died. Oh, what such a great guy. And pretends to mourn. Pretends that he has no idea about it. And then after a time of mourning goes by for him and for Bathsheba, brings Bathsheba to the palace. Makes her his wife and says, I did it. I got away with it. No one knows. The Bible says in 2 Samuel, verse 12, or chapter 12, that Nathan, the prophet, God reveals to Nathan what David has done, and Nathan goes to confront David in his hypocrisy. So Nathan says, hey, David, here's a story. Let me tell you a story. David's like, sweet, I love stories. And David is, begins to listen as Nathan tells the story. There's a rich guy. This rich guy had a bunch of livestock. He had a bunch of animals. He owned a bunch of lambs and, and cattle, and he owned a ton of stuff. And then there's this also the same area as a poor family. They don't have nearly the amount of resources this guy has. In fact, they have one lamb, but that lamb's not really livestock. That lamb's like a pet. Like that lamb lives in their house with them and eats off their table. That lamb has its own Instagram account. It's got funny stuff on it. I mean, they love this lamb. They, the family loves this, this pet. They love it so much. And this rich guy, he has people come over to visit him. And he says, you know what? It's getting time for lunch. But instead of taking one of his own livestock, he instructs someone to go to that poor people's house, steal that lamb away, and they kill and cook that lamb for lunch. And David, rightly, becomes angry. David, are you serious? That, that's a real story? That's the story I'm telling you. That, that's what happened. And so we read in verse 5 of chapter 12 of 2 Samuel, David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. That man must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan gets up and says to David, guess what? You are that man. You're the one who pretended not to know what was going on with Uriah. You're the one whose stole was not yours. You're the one who dishonored God. You're the one who had no pity. And this hypocrisy is revealed. He's caught. Is confronted. And David, to his credit, repents. David, to his credit, confesses his wrong. There were still consequences of that sin we dealt with. But he's willing to say, I did wrong. He's willing to come clean, as Nathan points out his sin. And so our prayer should be, God, help me to see my own hypocrisy. Help me not to get so bent out of shape of someone else's issues when I may have the same issues or worse going on in my own life. Jesus said it this way. Be careful that you and I don't get so crazy good at, at taking care of the specks in other people's eyes that we forget the two by four in our own eyeball. And don't. Be careful that we don't get so worried about someone's other issue when we have this, this huge issue in our own situation. Watch out for that. In fact, Jesus just to take care of your issue first and then you can help other people with their issues. And so our prayer should be, God, help me see my issues. God, help me see where I'm being a hypocrite. Point it out in me. In fact, it might even be, God, use someone in my life who will love me enough to point it out. Help me be open to their, not get defensive, not get angry. Help me be open to what they're trying to say to me as a believer who loves me as we love you. The Bible says over and over again, you and I were sheep. And sheep, again, that's not a compliment, just so you know. Just so you know. Sheep are pretty dumb, from what I understand. I haven't been around a lot that many sheep. But they're not the most intelligent animal. But sheep are pretty defenseless. They need protection of the flock. They need protection of a shepherd who loves them. Sheep easily wander away. Sheep easily get distracted. Ooh, shiny thing. And they go over this direction and leave the path. 
and, and walk away. And when they walk away, they can fall into a hole, fall down a, a fall, fall off a cliff, or, or get distracted so much so that they don't see the enemy coming toward them. And what a wolf loves to do is if it can separate a sheep from the flock, then that sheep is isolated and all alone, and it's vulnerable. And so with that in mind, here's what we read in James chapter 5, verse 19. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, again, it's family. It's love. It's for care for each other. He says this, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. What it's saying is here, listen, because we care for each other and we are fellow sheep, if you see someone wander away, bring them back to the flock. Bring them back to the herd. Bring them back uh, away from the approaching wolf. Say, no, 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 stay over here with us. And listen, listen, you can hear, you can hear the good shepherd. Let's stay with him. Let's trust in him. In fact, we want to be always so close to the shepherd that we know his voice. We, we recognize when he's talking to us. And it says here, listen, to any one of you who helps bring someone back who is used by God in this endeavor, listen, in this case, saving that person from death and bringing about the forgiveness of many sins, they're back in the right path. This, again, is what God would have us to do. Is this easy? No. This might take weeks, months, years. But don't give up. Why? Because we love each other. as the body of Christ. as the family of God. We love each other. We want everyone to be on the same path, following God, trusting God, not to wander away. But to remember, our source of life and truth and freedom is from the good shepherd, Jesus, who lays his own life down in the sheep. So we're going to pray. God, help me to confront carefully. God, help me to confront with restoration. God, help me to see my own hypocrisy. Point it out in me. I'm going to be interested in you. This is how we love the critical people. Let's just pray and ask God to give us strength to live this way in our lives. Father God, let me close this time. Lord, I know we covered so much. And to read a verse is easy, but to live it out, oh, that Lord, that can be so much tougher. So God, give us the ability to pray, not just once, but over and over again. I know in this room we have loved ones who have walked away in different ways, who are pretending that everything's okay when everything's not okay. And I know that it's even true for our own lives. So God, help us. We don't want to pretend something that's not true or believe something that's not true. God, help us to know the truth and have that truth set us free. God, I pray that you would help us have people in our lives who love us enough to point out our hypocrisy. God, give us the grace from you to respond in a way that would lead to repentance and our restoration. God, I pray that as you point out issues in someone else, God, may we love them and care for them the way that we will want someone to love us and care for us. Bring us back on our path to restore us to right relationship with you. God, we just ask you to help us not to just put up with hypocrisy or to stay silent, but God, to love people who are, who are hypocritical. God, may we do so for your honor, for your glory, and Lord, in obedience to what you've called us to do as your people. Thank you for once again for this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.